Yeah, our mountain opens on uh, Friday. You would think if I'm pushing the opening that I'd be sponsored by Snowball. But so I'm not. That would be kind of fun, though. Like, you know, just a shout out to Snowball, to Coleman, if you're listening. Preseason passes for the Keller family. I'll shamelessly promote your resort. It's on YouTube. What's that? It's on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube. Uh, actually, I'm not, I'm not trying to promote it. Did you, if you have the season pass, did you guys know that we, we, get, we get access to Brian right now? Yeah, I saw it. Did you see that? It's pretty yeah. awesome. Have you seen there? I have. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. There's, uh, there's some great stuff in, in Brian Head. Yeah, so if you have a season pass, it sounds sound like a commercial like this one. Okay. It's not. Okay, uh, well hopefully, so I'm, I'm going to be out of town. If you guys email me over the next couple of days, it might take me a little longer to, to respond. Some of you are like, oh, geez, so you're not very big to begin with. It's just going to get worse. But I'm going to be out of town. I mean, if everything goes well, I fly out, I fly in the morning, so we'll see how that works. Um, but I will be here Monday. Uh, so we'll have a lecture on Monday. We'll start cardiovascular. We'll finish up respiratory today. We'll start cardiovascular on Monday. And then we won't have class on, on Wednesday. Okay? Um, the only reason I keep reminding you of that is because I'm really excited about it. <laughs> I get time off just like you guys get time off. Um, so don't forget, Thanksgiving week, we do have our pre and post quiz in Target Vascular. Okay. And Friday is um, when the post quiz is due. It also happens to be like one of the largest shopping days of the year. But don't forget your post quiz. Okay. Maybe do it before you leave town. That might be a smart thing to do. Let's think about doing it before you leave. Okay. Any, any questions or comments before we start? Okay. So I have animal jokes today. Why did the cow cross the road? Why did the cow cross the road? To get to the other side. There you go. What do you call a cold dog sitting on a bunny? Chili dog on a bun. What do you call a thieving alligator? A thieving alligator. A crocodile. Very good. All right. Well done. Yeah, they get cornier as the semester goes on. Okay, so Monday we talked about, we introduced respiratory diseases, and you know, we kind of introduced these two categories, uh, obstructive diseases and then restrictive diseases. And we talk, which two do we talk about already as far as uh, obstructive? Emphysema and bronchitis. Okay. And emphysema, bronchitis, and, and we're going to talk about asthma and uh, bronchiectasis here. And that'll finish out obstructive, and then we'll move into restrictive diseases. Now, obstructive diseases, it's problem breathing in and out, but they're more exaggerated in which direction? Exhalation or expiration, okay, it's more exaggerated. Um, in fact, we'll talk about asthma, we'll talk about some measurements um, using spirometry, and some of you <coughs> have asthma, have probably taken these tests, uh, and so we'll, we'll walk into that right now. And then after asthma and bronchiectasis, we'll move into restrictive diseases. And then we'll go ahead and kind of um, make some comparisons at the end of the lecture between uh, kind of our two main ones, emphysema and bronchitis. Okay, so that's the plan. That's the roadmap for today. So asthma. How many of you have asthma, wrestle asthma symptoms, or have family members that have asthma? It was pretty common, okay? Uh, I, I have asthma as well. It was much worse when I was a kid. Uh, it doesn't really bother me much at all these days. I mean, if I get a cold, which is pretty rare, uh, it might impact my, it might, you know, hit my chest. So some of the things that I was telling you about from an asthma management standpoint is, it is actually more like firsthand knowledge of when I was young. You know, like if I got a, if I got a cold, I would make sure that you know my mom was really adamant about making sure that there wasn't 
mucus that was stuck in my chest, and we tried to make sure that we loosened it up so I could get it out. And it would avoid an infection. Uh, and I, I was actually pretty good with it. And, uh, and then I think this is like, you know, you hear about this, you, you grow out of it type of thing. And so what does that mean? So we'll talk a little bit about growing out of it here. We'll talk more about the science behind how asthma can change over time. But essentially those airways can become less irritable <coughs> as you age. Um, they can become um, less prone to flare-ups or bronchiospasms. And really that's what asthma is, is it's bronchial spasms that take place. So the airways are these tubes, and they're under the influence of uh, inflammatory, um, local inflammatory uh, events that can take place. And what will happen is the bronchial airways will actually restrict down, will spasm down. And it's hard to get them to open back up, and you need to relax them. Um, so a lot of these um, uh, pharmaceuticals that are used to treat asthma, they're bronchial dilators, right? They're beta agonists. And these bronchial dilators, those of you that raise your hand, how many of you ever had a nebulizer treatment? Does anybody know what a nebulizer is? It looks like a fancy bomb, right? Connected to a power supply that you plug in the wall. Okay, it's kind of a horrible analogy for an asthmatic, but there you have it. Okay, uh, so these bronchial dilators that are prescription strength are beta agonists because these beta receptors in the smooth muscle that line the airways will respond to uh, a beta agonist and they'll start to dilate. Well, it also happens to be uh, the same type of receptor that's found on the heart and it'll trigger the heart to accelerate its heart rate. And so if any of you have ever taken a nebulizer therapy, you'll know that one of the side effects is racing heart after you're done. Like, it's like, do, 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 right? Because you're dilating your airways, but you're actually absorbing some of that beta agonist drug systemically, and that's why, you know, one of the biggest complaints for asthmatics is, gosh, I hate taking a treatment because it makes me super jittery, or my heart starts racing, Okay, but what the, the point of the drug is to dilate the airway. Now, in older times, before we had beta agonists, actually, believe it or not, when I was really young, um, and you, you hear some of these kind of like old, you know, sort of Midwestern or like, you know, um, natural therapies, but some of them do work. Uh, so a hot, moist air also stimulates bronchial dilation. And so, before there were a lot of, you know, rampant use of beta agonists, uh, we would take, you know, pediatric kids and we'd put them in the bathroom, close the door, and turn on the shower on the hot, and steam up the, steam up the air. Uh, people, patients that are having uh, asthma attacks, let's say you don't have your inhaler, uh, get a, a warm <coughs> cup of, of, of water. You know, it's like boiling water, like tea, tea um, uh, temperature, and just sip on it. Kind of hold it over and breathe in the warm, moist air. That'll help dilate the airways. Okay. So this is a bronchial spasm issue. There's two types. There's extrinsic and there's intrinsic. We're seeing a sort of, not a pandemic, but we're seeing a rise in extrinsic stimulating asthma with the increased population globally. So this isn't just a U.S., you know, upper middle class issue of asthma, like I need cleaner air. You can imagine there's a lot of countries where there, there's poor air quality and there's dense population. And so extrinsic asthma would be things that are going to stimulate a bronchiospasm. Typically there's going to be some sort of irritant. There likely will be an IgE mediated response. So this is what type of hypersensitivity? Type 1. <coughs> So in our country, a lot of people that are allergic to, let's say you're allergic to cats, or dogs, or pet dander, or you know you have an allergy to um, uh, certain types of pollen, so in the springtime it just flares up, your asthma symptoms, an allergy-induced asthma, that's an extrinsic type of asthma, and it's a type 1 hypersensitivity, and you're making IgE antibodies <coughs> towards whatever allergen is, is present. And so this figure that's shown here, this diagram, is characterizing exactly what we're talking about. So here's our mucosal lining of the bronchial airways. 
Uh, you can appreciate the T helper cell, right? It is going to respond, and it's going to respond by initiating or activating the IgE um, B, or B cell to make IgE. Uh, IgE antibody is being released. You get mast cell, mast cell activation. You get degranulation. This degranulation causes rampant you know, histamine to flood into the area. And with that, you get inflammation. You get swelling. Right? You get um, fluid collection. You get mucus production. This is all due to an extrinsic type of uh, stimulator. And this is our immediate phase where you can kind of appreciate all the things that are happening here. We've got you know, eosinophil recruitment. we got our T helper cells hanging around. We have our IgE that's binding. And we get a stimulation of goblet cells in the mucosal lining to dump more mucus. And this kind of plugs up the system. Why is the mucus being produced? What, what's the thought process here by the body? Trap the allergen. Trap whatever the allergen is, exactly. So it's working really well. This is what's supposed to happen. This is a hypersensitization. So it's a normal response that's exaggerated beyond what it should be. And so now you get in the late phase, after hours, you actually get this mucus layer that makes it very difficult for breathing to take place. Well, so extrinsically, let's talk about a couple of other uh, examples. This is kind of the classic extrinsic because it's a type 1 hypersensitivity. There's an allergen, like some sort of you know, pollen, or it's pet dander, whatever that is, and all of us are pretty familiar with that. Well, there could be other things like you know, ozone or smoking. Um, pollution is where I would put next to ozone. That's what that's kind of translating to is polluted air. Um, obesity, why is this one listed here? Well, in certain patients where you've got um, obesity as an issue, uh, there's a lot of um, gastroesophageal reflux disease associated with obesity. <coughs> and every now and then, patients that have a lot of GERD will, on accident, um, um, inhale some of the reflux. Okay, so they aspirate and they inhale it a little bit. And that can actually cause irritation of the airways, which you can imagine. Okay, so you know, that, that would be, you know, kind of sounds horrible, but that's, that's actually a situation uh, that's real. Um, so this is a protective type of mechanism. It's a hypersensitivity, but this isn't necessarily due to an infection. Okay? Um, we, we're not talking about infection yet. We'll get into infection later when we talk about the we're talking about asthma. This is no infection. Patients that have asthma, they get, they're very prone to developing infections, as you can imagine. You get a lot of mucus, right? A lot of this gets plugged up. Some type of bacteria gets down in there, or sometimes a virus or a fungus, and, and they're very prone to developing pneumonia. Uh, but we're talking about no pneumonia, no infection, just um, an extrinsic mediated issue. All right, let's switch gears uh, to intrinsic. So you can see the airways. We've got a normal airway in cross-section, nice and open. And then here's our bronchiospasm. And it's that smooth muscle layer, which is that sort of pink-colored layer that constricts down. So when we talk about intrinsic, really what we're referring to is mainly just three things that are not associated with any allergen, or pollutant, or IgE. So the way to study this would be intrinsic is just these three, and everything else is probably going to be extrinsic. Does that make sense? So intrinsic means there's not really an external factor. So exercise induced, I mean, that's intrinsic because the system is exercising, and the stress on the system with exercise is causing bronchiospasms to take place. Stress-induced asthma. Uh, so one of the responses that's interesting in certain patients that have stress-induced asthma uh, is this uh, corticosteroid release. So this steroid, uh, corticosteroid release by the adrenal glands um, unfortunately can cause bronchiospasm in these patients. And so they get stressed out and they start wheezing, the asthmatic wheeze. <coughs> Cold. 
cold air. Okay. So I said, you know, if you're out exercising, let's say on Friday, and you develop an asthma attack while you're enjoying opening day at Snowball, right? And uh, you can get into the lodge and maybe get a, a, a warm or hot, steaming hot cup of uh, water to just sort of inhale and, and sip. Um, because the warm is going to dilate the airways, and cold has the opposite reaction as it constricts the airways. So some students get you know, mixed up with this, well, that's external. Isn't it cold outside? Well, the problem is that the airways become cold because it's cold air. So just think of it more of the response of the system, not necessarily that there's some you know, pollutant or antigen that's actually binding. Okay, so intrinsic versus extrinsic. I'd like you to be able to distinguish between the two different uh, categories. Well, regardless of what um, is causing the asthma, we can see microscopically um, some histology here to give us an idea of what's taking place. So on this first image, which is on the left, upper left, you can appreciate the bronchial cartilage at the right. So this is bronchial cartilage. This is the airway right here. And all of this exudate shouldn't be there. That's all mucus. There's eosinophils that are flooding in the area. Um, and the picture to the right is just a slightly higher magnification uh, bottom right of that particular situation. This is during an asthmatic attack. It's probably persisted for a few hours. Probably somebody that had an attack didn't have their inhaler, and it's gone on for an hour or two. Um, probably should get to the emergency department pretty soon. Uh, so you got hypertrophy of the smooth muscle, you've got edema, uh, you've got uh, inflammation and cellular recruitment of white blood cells. Most of these are eosinophils uh, that, are, that are in the area at this point. Um, you may or may not see neutrophils. You probably won't see macrophages in this exudate because they would take a lot longer. And usually the patient is going to be um, treated before that takes place because they're super uncomfortable. Okay. Um, <clears throat> questions on asthma. There's two big categories. Um, there's rescue meds, like the inhalers that I was talking about, or even the nebulizer therapy, which are beta agonists. Um, the uh, uh, second category would be daily managers. So these are patients that are on kind of a long-lasting uh, daily dose of a, um, a kind of a bronchial management uh, pharmaceutical. Uh, so it's not necessarily causing, it's, it's usually not steroid-based, the long-lasting ones, or the daily ones, whereas the rescue ones can be steroid-based that cause dilation. Uh, so two different strategies. Um, what we see in, in patients that are asthmatics is typically they're um, under-diagnosed. They're under-diagnosed, meaning that patients that wrestle with asthma typically uh, just uh, live with it. They deal with it. And so they kind of stay away from like a daily manager and they just have a rescue inhaler in their backpack. They may or may not pull it out. Okay. Um, so how do you diagnose somebody with asthma? Anybody have any ideas how you got diagnosed? Those of you that raise your hand. What's that? Mom's a nurse. Mom's a nurse. Doctor said I had asthma. Okay, that's, those are good answers. Okay. Well, so the, the test that we use is called spirometry. <coughs> and the measurement that we do, FEV1, is forced expiratory volume in the first second. Okay? So we said that this is a obstructive disease, asthma and it's worse on expiration. So spirometry test is, you'll have a device, you take a deep inhalation, and then you blow into the spirometer, which has a little mouthpiece, and it's connected to a machine, and it measures the volume of air that comes out in the first second. And here's the cutoffs. If your FEV1 represented as a percent a total expiratory volume. If you're greater than 
80%, you're quote unquote normal. Okay? If you're um, less than or equal to 79%, then you have, you're diagnosed with asthma. Make sense? There's a couple different categories. If you're 60 to 79, you'd be considered mild. So 60 to 79, mild. If you're 40 to 59, you're moderate. And then if you're 39 or below, then you're considered severe. <coughs> Make sense? So it's a pretty easy test. Um, so if you're curious, it's not invasive. You just breathe into a machine. It's not a big deal. Okay. Uh, and so I'll tell you like a little anecdote. Um, so I'm pretty active, and I had asthma when I was a kid, and um, you know the symptoms got way better, and I figured, okay, well I don't, I don't really have asthma. Anymore. And of course, I always had a rescue inhaler, and I would use it periodically. And then, of course, my physician told me at one, like you know, routine uh, appointment, say, "Hey, we should probably test you spirometry because I'm guessing maybe uh, I like to do certain like physical activities that are you know outdoors that are uh, relatively aggressive." He said, "You know, you might you might find your performance is superior if you are if your asthma is more appropriately managed." Well, you know, I just throw an inhaler in my backpack and I go. And um, he said, well, let's just test. So we tested him. Sure enough, I was in the mild range, but I was below that 80%. And he said, let's put you on a daily, it's a non-steroidal, and let's just see what happens over the next three to six months. And I mean, this was probably five years ago. And um, I had been so, like, surprised at how well the daily works that I never carry my rescue inhaler with me anywhere. Like, so severe, like last winter I did a, a helicopter trip, um, and where they drop you off, uh, this is a skiing trip, or snowboarding trip, they drop you off. And so you're literally, by helicopter, you're an hour for any medical services. And I actually, you know, you pack everything, you have it here, every, you know, all this kind of, you know, band-aids. Um, my, my buddies were like, band-aid, really? I'm like, well, what if, what if I need one? It's like, if you get hurt, you're not gonna Okay, so um, I forgot to pack my inhaler. I just, I totally didn't need it, but that's how far from my mind asthma is today. So if you're kind of right on the cusp, I'd encourage you just to see if you can manage the symptoms, because it definitely will, if, if, if you kind of think that you perform kind of at an elite level, um, you know, maybe for an old guy, I think in that category, um, it's, it's really amazing at how just a little bit more advantage can make a huge difference in your performance. Okay. Here's the other reason. So, um, my mother passed away not from brain cancer. She actually had um, lung cancer. It metastasized to the brain. We had to treat both. She was a non-smoker. Um, but um, uh, lung cancer, it doesn't just attack and hurt, you know, uh, target smokers. I mean, cancer, you know, it doesn't discriminate. It, it, it just targets everybody. So based upon this class of teaching like five years ago, I started thinking, wow, if there's some underlying inflammation that I'm dealing with chronically, could I be at risk of developing lung cancer prematurely? And the answer to that is yes. So there's another reason that you don't want to just live with some underlying disease. Does that make sense? Like if dad or grandpa just says, well, you know, I have heartburn, and, you know, I just, I just man up, and, you know, don't worry about it. You guys know how to have that conversation with dad and grandpa, right? And so it's kind of like practice what we preach. So I went in, took the test, and I'm like, okay, I'm in the mild category. Let's manage this so that, hey, it'd be great if I could mountain bike a little faster, if I could hike without, you know, even thinking about bringing an inhaler. Um, but then long term, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, maybe my lungs will be in better shape. And if there are genes in my family, you know, like the mom, I, I don't, you know, I want to try to make sure that I'm, I'm taking responsible steps. Okay, so just little anecdotes, like maybe you can tell your family members, you can tell your patients, hey, there's a reason that I want you to get this test. I know that you're, 
you're, you're, you know, a functioning individual and you don't think you need it, but let's just see what's going on. Because maybe you could actually reduce your risk for developing something later in life, and or you might be able to improve your performance right now. Those are both great options. Okay? Questions on, yeah? What is the daily manager, like, what's that treatment? Uh, so mine is like a, a little uh, inhaler, but it's not an aerosol-based inhaler. It's uh, like you crack a capsule, that you can't taste it. And, uh, every day? Every day, yeah. Like, I do it like right before I brush my teeth. Because one of the side effects of a lot of these daily inhaler meds is you can develop thrush within your mouth. Yeah, so you so if you use it, you need to rinse out your mouth. So I do it right before I brush my teeth, and it sort of like, you know, takes care of itself. It's really easy. Like, you know, sits next to the toothbrush in the door. You know, you can hardly think about it. So I always pack that. But it's like a one a day. You don't take it, I don't take it on a bike ride. I don't take it up the mountain. Um, you know, you know, you just you kind of forget about it. It's just part of like um, you know, I've incorporated it into sort of like just daily grooming or whatever, you know, brushing your teeth and taking an inhaler and then you're done with it. So anyways, just Little things, that, you know, I, this is something that I decided to do years ago, um, and, um, you know, I, I think some of these anecdotes are important for us to talk about. Okay, so shifting out of asthma. So bronchiectasis. Yeah, it's funny, because when I was younger, I used to be more competitive, and I'd always remember to take my healer. So now I'm kicking myself, like, wow, what if I, what if I would have, you know, when I was young, 10 years ago, I would have adapted some of these, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah, I might have been more competitive, but... Bronchiectasis. Okay, so this is permanent bronchial dilation due to some type of long-term obstruction. So, this could be an infection. But it's a long-term infection. Most people, you get a lung infection, you're in pretty miserable shape, so you get treated. But... There is a patient population, unfortunately, cystic fibrosis, so abbreviated CF. It's a relatively common recessive genetic disease. It infects the entire, uh, affects the entire body. Um, it causes progressing uh, disability and typically early death in patients. And it's called cystic fibrosis because of the scarring or the fibrosis that takes place um, within, oftentimes, the pancreas, um, but it also targets the lungs. And so it's most commonly been associated with a, with a bronchiectasis lung disease. And, and then you get a chronic infection that shows up, these cysts that form. And um, it was first diagnosed in the 1930s, actually, actually in the pancreas, not in the lungs. But um, most of the serious infections are dealt with because of the lung problems, and that's actually what takes the patient, usually as lung failure. You can treat it with antibiotics because it is an infection-based problem, but um, usually it's not cured. Uh, the infection clears up, and then it's just a matter of time before another infection shows up. Um, <clears throat> there's a multitude of other symptoms associated with CF patients. They've got um, uh, typically chronic sinus infections, They've got poor growth, so they're usually uh, short in stature. Um, a lot of uh, GI issues like diarrhea that's chronic, um, not have anything really to do with the bowel, but because of uh, uh, the pancreatic issues with digestion. Um, and even infertility uh, can result in patients with CF. So usually what happens is there's a sticky mucus that binds up in the lungs as well as the digestive tract. That's why they've got this chronic diarrhea. Um, this image that you see here um, is um, uh, showing this dilation that takes place due to inflammation. Um, so you've got these pockets or these holes that are found within the lobes of the lung. Um, in patients that don't have CF, they could have an infection that's chronic. Uh, but oftentimes when we see bronchiectasis, it's going to be in these CF patients. Uh, the features is there's, um, there's phlegm or sputum that's, that's coughed up, um, and usually it's 
plentiful, copious. Um, it's foul smelling because it's infected. So it has a, it, it's a purulent discharge. Uh, that means that it's an infected um, you, uh, pus, if you will. They have shortness of breath. They have a chronic cough. Um, they run a fever because they have a chronic infection. And um, they're at an increased risk for bacterial infection that's throughout the body because they're basically in a chronic infected state. So that's the fourth of our four examples of obstructive diseases. Uh, questions on emphysema, chronic bronchitis, asthma, or bronchiectasis. But I shift gears into restrictive. Again, restrictive, um, worse or exaggerated on inhalation, doesn't mean that other respiratory diseases, there's not problems with inhaling. It's they're more exaggerated on the exhalation, which is the reason I, I'm showing you this chart, because this is forced expiratory volume in the first second. For asthma, that's how you diagnose it, as a exhalation disease. Does that make sense? An obstructive disease. So now we're over in the restrictive category, and in the restrictive category, we've got pulmonary disorders that are going to impact a reduction in the expansion capacity of the lung. So you're going to reduce lung capacity, in other words. You're not going to be able to take as deep of an inhale breath. Okay? So inhalation is kind of a challenge. Expiratory volume is normal or, or near normal, or it's proportionally reduced to total lung capacity. And this chart is just from the previous slide on Monday, kind of characterizing um, the different categories of, of the volume of air uh, in, in the different um, features of respiratory movement. And so we're going to kind of look at a couple of main categories with restricted pulmonary disorders. Um, many of these are associated with uh, chest wall disorders or like pleural diseases or diseases of the pleural cavity. Um, infiltrating diseases, this is where pneumonia fits. Um, we'll look at things like acute respiratory distress syndrome. A number of years ago, um, abbreviated ARDS, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. This was actually super popular. Not like everybody wanted it, meaning like, like a lot of people were getting it. Um, and ARDS, um, years ago, it was um, in um, Asian countries. And we'll talk kind of about where, where that comes from because of a, a coronavirus that's being transmitted um, by these little organisms in, in Asia, these, these uh, creatures, palm cells is what they are, kind of like a little raccoon. Uh, so restrictive diseases, reduced lung capacity overall, what are the characteristics? This is a trichrome image, so a three color image in all of the blue. That you see, we looked at this type of staining before when we looked at uh, liver and renal. And that blue stain, does everybody remember what the blue stain in a trichrome is highlighting? What was it? Collagen, thank you, very well done. Excessive collagen being laid down. What does that tell you? Now, at the end of the semester, now that you know what you know, what does that tell you when the lung tissue has excessive collagen that's being laid down? It's new collagen. Scarring. Fibrosis, okay? So the general characteristics, right? We've got either chest wall disorders or we've got acute or chronic um, infiltrating diseases. In our chest wall disorders um, that, that happen with normal lungs, we could have issues associated with obesity um, and a lot of fibrosis. So, for example, if that patient that's obese has GERD and they're aspirating a little bit of their reflux every now and then, Chronically over time, you're going to develop an inflammatory issue in the lungs and you're going to have a model and you're going to have scarring. And so now you move out of the category where it was obstructive, now you're in the category of restrictive disease too. Okay? There could be chest wall disorders like um, pleural infections, right? where you've got the um, parietal and the visceral pleura, the two membranes that surround the lungs. And there's, between the pleura 
is a pleural space that's slightly negative pressure. You guys remember that? Um, and there's a little bit of fluid in there so that it's you know smooth, it's lubricious, but it's mostly air. And um, if you have inflammation of the pleura, then you can actually have fibrosis that's happening around the lung, and that can compromise overall lung architecture and prevent a deep inhalation. So now lung capacity goes down. Acute chronic interstitial or infiltrative diseases. We're going to now talk about acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, so what is it? Well, it's referred to as a couple of different things. So lung shock, <coughs> diffuse alveolar damage, dad, we talked about that before when we talked about uh, evali. You guys remember that? So evali was the e-cigarette vaping associated lung injury. So we're seeing that patients now with the sort of newly discovered disease, evali, are developing symptoms that are representative of almost AR, ARDS, where they've got diffuse alveolar damage due to that vitamin E acetate that we were talking about on Monday. Um, the other example, or the other name for uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome is called traumatic wet lung. So why is there a military picture here? Well, traumatic wet lung was a name that came out of the Vietnam War. And ARDS, or ARDS, was a major cause of death of soldiers in Vietnam. And one of the reasons was they're in Asia, and they were being exposed to a lot of infiltrating diseases uh, that were airborne, and they weren't prepared for it. They weren't vaccinated against it. And uh, I don't know, did any of you get, like, the pneumonia vaccine every now and then? There's actually a vaccine for pneumonia. Uh, I actually get it. I think you only have to get it, like, once every five years or something. It's very, it's very highly recommended for patients that um, like have asthma, like, like I do. Um, also for our older population where they developed um, a respiratory illness, it could be um, very, very dangerous, almost lethal. Uh, so in, in Vietnam, we had a lot of soldiers that were dying of traumatic wet lung is what they were calling it. And I'll show you some of the pictures or the images of why we're referring to it that way. But rapid onset of... ARDS, A-R-D-S, or lung shot, D-A-D, or traumatic wet pump, um, induces a life-threatening respiration insufficiency. You can't breathe. And there's rampant alveolar damage as a result of the infection. And this infection, because oftentimes it's bacterial or viral, you get inflammation, and so now you get this huge exudate that moves in. And it's primarily neutrophilic. And then later on, like a week of, of dealing with that, you get um, alveolar macrophages that show up. Okay. So if we look at these cute little creatures, like on this slide, this is a palm civet, P-A-L-M. C-I-V-E-T. So this palm civet um, is kind of a major culprit. It's a mammal. It weighs about um, four and a half to ten pounds. Pretty small. And it actually carries a lot of these coronaviruses that um, will impact the lungs. The pathophysiology isn't completely well understood. Um, picture of the virus is down here in the lower right. So these creatures are what are carrying this. They're a food supply in many countries in Asia. Okay, so that's one way that patients can actually become infected. But it targets um, in, in Asian populations um, the lower lungs primarily uh, that are, that are in, uh, affected um, or impacted by the coronavirus. And this ARDS, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, if it's left unchecked or untreated, can lead to what we call severe acute respiratory syndrome. Right? There's a lot of acronyms, but this actually can lead to what we call SARS, acute 
respiratory, um, severe acute respiratory syndrome. And in these types of situations, these patients basically are suffocating. So what, what happens? So let's look at these images. These are x-rays, these are chest x-rays. And this is a patient that has been infected with a coronavirus. You can't really see the, it's kind of cut off at the bottom, but hopefully you can free it. It's on there, it's just it's not on the white part, it's kind of on the black part. So this is a coronavirus infection coming from one of these creatures. And you can see on x-ray these chest radiographs of a, of a patient with severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS. So they've got SARS because they're in acute respiratory distress. Right? ARDS leads to SARS. Yeah. Funny, right? So look at day five. So the lungs, if you remember back to the commute, commuted tomography or the CT imagery that I showed when we looked at e-cigarettes and vaping, if we pull up that image again, very, very similar, but just higher resolution in CT. But the lungs themselves that you're looking at on this x-ray, which is this this curvature right here is because of the diaphragm. What is this white out right here? Is that a tumor? That's the heart. Very well. Okay. That was a trick question. You can see um, the ribs and this black space that I'm tracing. This is the left lung. This is the patient's right lung. And obviously the left lung is a little smaller because there's a little bit more of a notch cut out for the heart. But this little cloud right here, all of this region here that's cloudy, that should all be as black as this area right here or this area right here. So in a lung x-ray, you should see mostly dark. If you see white contrast, it's because you've got fluid typically that's there. So like a tumor would show up, okay, lesions would show up. Here, you go from day five, it's getting worse at day 10, right? It's getting worse, look at the, look at the right lung. This complete x-ray whiteout is what we call it. You can't even really tell the difference between where the diaphragm ends and where the lung begins. Okay? And it's continuing to progress north, if you will. Use the heart as your indicator marker. You kind of see the bottom curvature of the heart here. Here it's actually day 15, it's migrating further north. So a lot of lung edema, um, a lot of uh, fluid collection in the lungs. We've got uh, shortness of breath. We've got, what's tachypnea? So it's referring to breathing rate, tachypnea. Rapid breathing, right? Rapid breathing. Cyanosis, right? We already looked at cyanosis. What was that? Bluish skin color because they're not getting enough oxygen. Um, hypoxemia. Low O2 in the blood, right? And they're often refractory to oxygen therapy. What does that mean? What does that terminology mean? They don't respond if you give them oxygen. You put a mask, oh, give them oxygen. Give them pure oxygen. They'll feel better. She'll feel better. They don't respond to it. Why don't they respond to the oxygen? What's happening? It can't get to the lung. Right? You're not getting gas exchange. Because you've got all this fluid that's obstructing the gas exchange from inside the lung to where the capillaries are. It needs to load the hemoglobin molecule in the red blood cell. You can't make it there. There's too much fluid in the way. You with me? So that's that. So they won't. So this really puzzles physicians typically, because the patient comes in, can't breathe, so they put him on oxygen. He's not getting any better. What? Huh? See what I mean? They do an X-ray and they're like, oh wow, the lungs. I don't, I don't know if the guy's got cancer or what's going on. Right? right. So this is a big deal. And there was, you can research the last outbreak. I didn't have time to research what the last outbreak was. Of, of ARDS or SARS, 
But typically, what you'll see is it, it originates in Asia. Uh, and then, it, you know, what ends up happening, we had a problem, gosh, I can't remember exactly how, someone can Google it right now, um, but there were um, SARS or ARDS outbreaks that were happening on um, international flights in and out of Asia. It's freaking people out, right? And everybody get on a plane with a mask, right? You didn't know, do they have it, or are they trying to protect themselves from it, right? So, it, 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 this was a big deal, and uh, you can probably Google when was the last outbreak. But. Okay, let's shift gears away from arms. Um, we don't have time. Okay, we'll do it Let's talk lastly about pneumonia. This is our last disease. I flipped the wrong switch. I'm not trying to cool it off again, I promise. I turned it off right away. Uh, pneumonia. So, pneumonia is kind of a huge deal um, that you hear about, especially during this time of the year. Okay, temperatures get cold. Things get more wet. Okay. Now, pneumonia can actually be bacterial, viral, or fungal. And it's really important to determine what type of pneumonia the patient is wrestling with. Now, believe it or not, the palm civet and the coronavirus in the United States is not the number one cause of ARDS. Okay. Pneumonia is. Acute respiratory distress syndrome can be caused not just by this little fuzzy cute creature, right? Because like I said, I'm not getting on a plane to Asia. Well, if you live in the U.S., you could contract pneumonia, okay? And many of your patients, especially the elderly, will likely wrestle with the risk of getting pneumonia. And so now, ARDS could happen as a result of a pneumonia infection. Patients that have asthma long-term are at higher risk of developing pneumonia. That's why we vaccinate asthmatics and our elderly population with their pneumonia vaccine. Uh, like every five years or something. I don't know, ask your parents, they'll tell you. <clears throat> so, picture of streptococcal pneumonia. Um, played it out on a culture. This is what it looks like. Like these little rod-like structures. And then in a scanning electron microscope, Pretty cool um, mugshot of streptococcal pneumonia. So, what is it? Well, it's an infection of the lung. That's what simply it is. Pneumonia is a lung infection. Most common to um, like street lingo with with people is they get a chest cold. They're like, I think I got pneumonia. Or if it's not pneumonia, it's bronchitis, and I ain't got time for. <laughs> so, so bronchitis and pneumonia, right? They're 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 not near. They're not they're not even on the same category, right? It's like, well, which one is it? I don't know. I think if it's really severe, it's pneumonia. If it's not that severe, I got chronic bronchitis. It's like, well, wait a second. So those are the two most widely misused terminologies that we're talking about in this particular section. Not everybody has chronic bronchitis. And not everybody has pneumonia. You might just have a, a, a chest cold, okay? Yeah, you could have a mild infection. But here, this is an infection of the lung parenchymal tissue that's been lasting a little while. Okay? So you've got a normal aerated lung on the right, and you've got neutrophil infested exudate on the left. And I love this slide that I found because... Um, look at look at this delineation. It's like this is the same slide. This wasn't like a Photoshop thing. Like this is one piece of tissue from this patient <coughs> that was wrestling with a pneumonia infection. Could be bacterial, could be fungal, could be viral. If it's bacterial, yeah, antibiotics would work. If it's a virus infection, then then you need an antiviral. It's not going to respond to an antibiotic. Now, a lot of times when you have fungal or back, uh, viral infections, uh, oftentimes bacteria will colonize as well. So some of you are like, well, I always hear that, but then I go get a course of antibiotics and I do feel a little bit better, but then the sickness never goes away completely. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of research that shows cohabitation with bacteria, bacteria viruses, and fungus. So yeah, the, the patient might actually respond at some level to an antibiotic. But if it's an underlying viral infection or fungal infection, you're not going to get rid of the root cause. You may just be treating one of the coal-colonizing um, you know, uh, species 
if you will. Okay, so we've got a couple of different types and a couple of different locations that we need to uh, talk about. But a couple of statistics. So 250,000 people in the U.S. annually are treated for pneumonia. This is just U.S. only. 250,000. Anyone else? You know, a quarter of a million. It's not that high. Yeah, but 50,000 of them died. As a result, it's <laughs> like, whoa. So that is not, someone can do that calculation real quick, but that's not a really great success rate. Okay? What's that number? Somebody do that for 20%. 20%. One fifth of the patients in the U.S. that are treated with pneumonia, we're not talking about the one walking down the street, like, how do you feel? Oh, man, I've been wrestling with pneumonia for weeks. Not that guy. I'm talking about people that actually get diagnosed by a physician as having pneumonia. Okay? Okay? 20% of them are going to pass. I mean, this is a big deal. Okay? All right, we've got a couple of different... Um, a couple of different types to talk about. So let's talk about uh, community or typical acquired. Um, so this is um, uh, bacterial. Bacterial is called a typically acquired, often, most commonly, is bacterial. Atypical would be the fungal or the viral. So oftentimes patients have pneumonia, and we're going to assume that it's a bacterial type of pneumonia. And the first course of action may, in fact, be to use an antibiotic. They're probably going to do some culture swab, a lavage, okay, to pull out fluid. Remember, you flush, remember we talked about, we flush the lungs, pull out the fluid, culture it out, and see if these little boogers grow, okay? Um, atypical would be viral or fungal. Um, we've got nosocomial pneumonia and chronic pneumonia that I want to highlight. So nosocomial, nosocomial is usually gram negative, meaning it's also referred to as, uh, or it's also referred to as hospital acquired pneumonia. Now, like, so you hear this all the time. Grandma went in for a hip replacement, got pneumonia in the hospital, came out, or never came out, okay? And that's captured in this statistic, unfortunately. So the 20%. So this is a big deal in our elderly population. That's why if you if you hang out in um, um, you know assisted living hospitals or homes and things like that, like you're volunteering and stuff, and you listen to the patients talk, they are deathly afraid, literally deathly afraid of going to the hospital for anything, for surgery especially, because they have a lot of examples of friends that never came home. They got pneumonia, they never left, and then they passed. So this gram-negative, um, the cell wall contains a, um, a peptide glycan layer, and it's surrounded by a very thick plasma membrane. And um, that's our gram-negative type of bacteria that's very difficult to treat because of that membrane. They're, they're not like resistant to antibiotics, but that, that glycoprotein covering um, causes a difficult situation for antibiotics to actually penetrate and treat. Um, so, what was the other one I wanted to talk about? Uh, chronic pneumonia. Okay, so chronic pneumonia in patients uh, can be a big issue where it's one infection followed by another infection followed by another infection. Okay, and you know, these patients would be captured in the statistic as well, but chronic pneumonia um, is, is a really big problem. Okay, so let's talk about gray uh, hepatization versus red hepatization. And so this is often referring to um, uh, the lobes or where we're actually seeing, seeing the infection. So the most common cause of lobular pneumonia, I think I mentioned, was streptococcal. Gray hepatization, kind of the picture up top on the upper right, sort of the less left side of that diagram, that gray hepatization that's talking about um, bronchial pneumonia. So these are pneumonia that's actually happening where it's more localized to um, the bronchi versus the lung parenchymal tissue itself. Red hep uh, hepatizing is often associated with lobular 
pneumonia, where it's actually affecting the lobes of the lung. So we, it's not exclusive that you've got um, only the bronchi affected or the lobes of the lung infected, uh, but you would have a propensity of the infection in grade hepatization for it to be the bronchial airways that have the infection, whereas over in red hepatization, it's actually the lobular portion of the lung itself. Okay? It is not like mutually exclusive, it's just the patient if it's presenting, most of the infection is in the lobes, then it would be lobular. Versus if the patient has a lot of the infection in the bronchial airways, uh, then it would be uh, gray hepatization. Does that make sense? And so the little circular spheres are trying to indicate the bronchial tubes that are kind of coming out at you out of the screen versus the entire lobe itself. So why the difference? Well, if, um, if you have a, a, an infection, let's say it gets trapped in the bronchial tree, and that's where the infection stops. Versus if you have, you have the bacteria that makes it into the bronchial tree, and it goes all the way down into uh, infecting the lobes of the lung, that's, a, that's a two completely different situations. Okay? I don't know which one is more difficult to treat or which one's easier to treat. Don't have that statistic, and I don't have any patients to be able to tell you, in my experience, which one's easier to treat. Both sound horrible, okay? Um, why do they call it gray embasization and red embasization? Like, how, how, do you, how do they see that in diagnosis? Um, so I don't know the answer to that other than with, um, um, with the red, it's referring to uh, the tissue itself because you get a lot of like hemorrhagic looking tissue because it's in the lung tissue itself. And you've got inflammation that's there, so you've got all this exudate material which is like red inflamed material. Yeah. Um, and so the lung tissue itself on biopsy has more of a reddish appearance. Okay. Maybe gray because it doesn't look red and it looks more like it normally does, which is a gray color. But that's total speculation. Okay. So I know that the red is called that because of the inflammation in the lobe. I don't know why they call it gray, but I'm assuming it's because if you don't have the red color there, the tissue probably looks more gray. And it's from biopsy. Biopsy, yeah, bi sorry, biopsy, yeah. You're not going to see that color on CT or on x-ray, you're only going to get it on a biopsy. Like what you have here, right here. Okay, questions? Alright, I've got an activity to finish this out. Okay, so I want you to kind of find a blank piece of paper or a free space. And I want you to do both of these activities. Okay? You got a little time. Some of you look super excited because this is what you look like. <laughs> so you gotta grab, you gotta grab a writing utensil. Does anybody need a pencil? Who needs a pencil? <laughs> okay, awesome. I want you to draw a picture of an asinus that's normal versus one that's affected with emphysema. Just draw it out. You don't have. I am not an arm like the least artistic person in the room, and I drew one on the board. Wednesday. You guys remember that? Start with normal, <coughs> and go ahead and draw one that's wrestling with emphysema. I'm surprised nobody's asked which type. Draw them both. Draw them both, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Good answer. Bless you. If you're like, what do you mean, looks tight? I'm totally lost. You need to watch Monday's lecture.
You guys ready for the next one? All right, for those of you that are accelerated, I'm going to tell you what the next one is. It's on the board, but draw a second picture. Here you're comparing contrasting uh, chronic bronchitis from a normal bronchial tree. You did not draw this one. So you have to think outside the box. Things that you think are happening with chronic bronchitis. What would that bronchial tree look like? We did not do this on Monday, so this is, I know, you have to think and be creative. I know you can do it. So normal bronchial tree, chronic bronchitis. We're still working. A couple of people are. You're not turning it in. You know, I can embarrass you when you're drawing. It's more for your benefit. We'll, we'll talk about it. I got some examples. I'm just going to While we're waiting, let's share some of the um, clinical features or the clinical sequela associated with patients that wrestle from each of these conditions. Let's take emphysema first. Like people are finished with drawings. What's going to happen with a patient who's wrestling with emphysema clinically? What's that? They, they're a pink puffer. What does that mean? What does that mean to you guys? Skin, skin is pink in coloration. Why? Exertion, exertion, yeah. A lot of energy being spent trying to exhale. High, high metabolism because they're well, they're they're burning a lot of calories trying to trying to breathe, focus on breathing. What about weight? Typical weight. These are stereotypes, but weight because they're a lot of weight loss. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, like double exercise that we did. Yeah, they're bringing, bringing in the upper end on their lung capacity. Are they going to have shortness of breath? For sure. What's that word? Shortness of breath. So, yeah. Dyspnea? Okay. All right, how about chronic bronchitis? Clinical features on chronic bronchitis. Blue bloater. What else? Cough with sputum, barrel chested. Well, barrel chested should be uh, emphysema, right? You're up here. All right, if I look at my chest, I'm... All right, it's going to out. Call blue bloaters, all right? Cough with sputum. It had a productive cough. What was the definition I used? You guys remember? Yeah, usually they got a productive cough that's been going on for a few months. Okay, everybody in the drawing? Okay. So, okay. the left slide is kind of what we drew before, right? On the board. So we've got our panna center emphysema on the right. We have centra center on the bottom left. Which one is more prominent with cigarette smoking? 
centra. Yeah. Okay. Normal asinus is up top in panel A. All right, so that's our respiratory zone, respiratory bronchial, alveolar duct, and the alveolus itself. And over here, you haven't seen this picture until now, but I didn't want to show it to you because I wanted you to try it yourself. So the chronic bronchitis picture <coughs> that I think is most uh, straightforward is, is looking at the tube. Here's our healthy bronchial airway. Here we've got excessive inflammation, so this is constricted down. And we've got mucus. You can see this mucus that's present. And that's going to be persistent. I don't love this picture nearly as much as I love this one over here. But the idea in emphysema is that the um, alveoli are breaking down. So here on chronic bronchitis, I mean, really what you're looking at is you're looking at a tube simply like this versus a tube that's constricted down, and it, it's probably something like, like this, and you pick up another color and you say, we've got mucus that's lining most of the airway, right? Just for a visualization. Pretty clear? So you should be able to compare and contrast Emphysema versus chronic bronchitis. Questions on respiratory diseases? Call it a day.